it was a strong speech, um, but I think people are still wondering, so what does that mean you're going to do, right? We have seen him um, and his administration basically say they're not going to push for any changes um, to the filibuster other than him being open to a talking filibuster at this point. And so those are the conversations that are still happening. Told to vote. They went out in a pandemic and voted. They sent two Democrats to, uh, the, to the Senate from Georgia. And now what they're hearing is, well, here's how you vote again. This is how you fight against this. They're like, well, we voted. Like, that's not enough. We need the people who we vote. Oh, that the way he sees it, he sees it as this existential threat to our democracy. If you see something as an existential threat to our democracy, you usually have to be ready to roll out actions that match that dire declaration if you're the president of the United States of America. And I think that what people feel is lacking is that action plan. Is it simply opaque to us, Ken? I mean, during his campaign, Joe Biden did tell everybody that nothing would fundamentally change under his presidency. And lo and behold, ain't shit changed. But let's examine his legislative record before today. It's clear that a legal strategy will take too long. Democrats will be voted out of their majorities in the House and Senate before anything can be done. As Kim said, you know, Democrats went out and voted. They overcame the hurdle of the pandemic, the hurdle of the ex-president saying lunatic things about in-person voting and, and, and absentee voting and mail-in voting. They did everything they were supposed to do. And this president has now presided over the greatest rollback of access to the right to vote in modern history. 22 new laws, 389 in total making their way through all 48 states. That is a inconvenient fact, but that is the fact of this president's record in terms of what's happened in this country when it comes to voting rights. Why can't he convene a meeting every morning at 6 a.m. with Joe Manchin, who has said he's for something, it isn't everything, and get to 50 and then push for filibuster reform? Why can't that start today? Biden became senator of Delaware in 1972 at the tender age of 29, winning by only 3,000 votes. During this time, he was one of the Senate's strongest opponents to race integration busing. He became ranking minority leader of the Senate Judiciary Committee in 1981. And in 1993, Biden voted for a provision that deemed homosexuality incompatible with military life, thereby banning gays from the military and creating the don't ask, don't tell policy that we're all familiar with. One of the biggest stains on Joe Biden's record is his writing in strong support of the 1994 crime bill, whose legacy is little more than locking up black and brown and poor white people by the millions. Crime in America had tripled between 1960 and 1990, inflamed by a crack cocaine epidemic in the 1980s. Working with police groups, Biden wrote the Senate version of the bill, which he used to proudly call the Biden Crime Bill. In 1996, he voted for the Defense of Marriage Act which prohibited the federal government from recognizing same-sex marriages, thereby barring individuals in such marriages from equal protection under federal law and allowing states to do the same. I'm curious about the word activist. Do you think it's only activists that are mad? You don't think it's the Democratic voters who are frustrated that they do with everything they're asked to do? They turn out, they vote, they revive Joe Biden's ailing primary efforts. They, you know, are, are all in. He has a 60 percent approval rating. His COVID relief package passed without a single Republican vote. Reconciliation for a lot of the stuff that progressives care about on infrastructure is going to pass without a single Republican vote. You think it's just an activist problem? Because that is the White House's diagnosis, Matt Miller. To this day, Joe Biden is widely considered to be the only reason why the controversial Justice Clarence Thomas resides on the Supreme Court. During the Thomas hearings in 1991, Biden refused to conduct a full investigation into sexual harassment allegations against him. The committee called on Thomas's accuser, Anita Hill, to testify, but Biden did not allow for additional testimony from other witnesses. Other women had the opportunity to come forward but were stopped from doing so, and ever since then, Joe Biden has been remembered for his actions during the Thomas hearings. Biden was a longtime member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He became its ranking minority member in 1987 and chaired it from June 2001 to 2003 and 2007 to 2009. Biden voted against authorization for the Gulf War in 1991. He was a strong supporter of the war in Afghanistan, saying, whatever it takes, we should do it. 
As head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he said in 2002 that Iraqi President Saddam Hussein was a threat to the national security, and there was no other option than to eliminate that threat. In October 2002, he voted in favor of the authorization for use of military force against Iraq, approving the U.S. invasion of Iraq. As chair of the committee, he assembled a series of witnesses to testify in favor of the authorization. They gave testimony grossly misrepresenting the intent, history, and status of Saddam and his secular government, which was an avowed enemy of al-Qaeda, and touted Iraqis fictional possession of weapons of mass destruction. Biden eventually became a critic of the war and viewed his vote and role as a mistake, but did not push for withdrawal. Look, the reality is that with the highly Republican gerrymandered 2022 midterms quickly approaching, the Democrats are certainly going to lose their supermajority, if not both chambers. And once that's happened, what will they have to show for defeating Trump in 2020 other than the day one coronavirus relief package and a possible, if not likely, defeat in 2024?